All right, once again, it's time for your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are on our YouTube channel, just put in a question in one of the comment boxes or in the general channel. I will find it, scoop it up, and answer it here. So let's get started. Fraser, I thought about space travel in the sun, wind, radiation problem. Can we not just use an artificial magnetic field? The problem with space travel, as you mentioned, is that there is radiation charged particles streaming from the sun, there's cosmic radiation. It's a bad place to be outside of a magnetic field like the Earth has for a very long period of time. One of the ideas that NASA has been working on is to surround a spacecraft in an artificial magnetic field that gets generated. The problem, and NASA's actually looked into this and they've tried to build some prototypes, the problem is that the amount of power that's required, that's an eagle by the way, Okay. The problem is the amount of power that's required is just more than we can create today. But definitely in the long term, one of the ideas is that you will create an, use an artificial magnetic field, a force field, that you'll surround your spaceship and that will collect and redirect the charged particles that are coming from the sun. I'm at all racy. What if the black hole at the center of the galaxy expired? How important is it? The supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, it's like 4.1 million times the mass of the Sun, which sounds like it's a lot, but it's actually a very tiny fraction of the entire mass of the entire Milky Way galaxy. And so it's not like acting like an anchor for the whole galaxy. The reality is that the huge cloud of dark matter that surrounds the Milky Way is the thing that is actually anchoring the stars and keeping everything in, in place as they, as they rotate. The black hole is not that important. Now, supermassive black holes and smaller black holes, they don't, I mean, not, they won't expire. They can't run out of energy, die the way stars do. The only way we know is that maybe over long, long periods of time, they will evaporate. But by the time the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way has evaporated, all of the stars in the Milky Way will be gone. Planets will have probably been eaten by various black holes. There'll just be nothing left. And so at that point, it won't really matter. Abdul Ahad, is it possible in any galaxy to have more than one black hole? Sure, but it sort of depends on the kind of black hole that we're talking about. There's two classifications of black holes. There's the stellar mass black holes. These are the ones that are show up after a much more massive star than our sun, explodes as a supernova, and then you get this this black hole is a remnant. And these can form all over the Milky Way. And there are probably thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe more in the, in the Milky Way. I'm not sure the exact number. Um, but then there are the supermassive black holes. And so the Milky Way has the one at the heart of, of the Milky Way. Andromeda has one at the heart of Andromeda. And the only time that you get m multiple supermassive black holes is when galaxies collide. And the two if you get the right kind of collision, then the, the mass supermassive black holes at the heart of the two galaxies will come together, they'll orbit around each other, and eventually they'll merge. So if you find two supermassive black holes in any one galaxy, that means that two galaxies recently merged and the mass supermassive black holes are in the process of coming together. Debbie Duran. Shut up, dude. The ISS doesn't exist in space. It's not a question, Debbie, but I will take it anyway. I, get, I, don't, I, I don't understand, like I can understand if you don't believe in a thing that's really hard to test out. But the International Space Station is a thing you can see with your own eyeballs. It comes by the Earth on a very regular basis and there's many apps and websites you can go to where you, it, it will tell you exactly when the International Space Station is going to fly right over your head. And then you can go outside and you can look up and there it goes, as predicted. Now you'd be like, well, what is it? It's just a star or, or whatever. You can use binoculars, even just like fairly medium level binoculars, and you can see the shape of the International Space Station. You can see those, those solar panels as they glint in the sunlight. And if you have a better telescope or you're willing to be patient or you get the timing right, you can see the space station pass in front of the moon. You can see it passing in front of the sun. People have done some amazing things getting pictures of the International Space Station. So if there's a thing that you 
don't believe exists because it conflicts with your, I don't know, sense of reality or whatever, pick something that's harder to prove because the International Space Station is super easy to prove. Johnny Hartz. Can you make another film showing actual pictures of satellites in space? It's really hard to find one that isn't CGI. I'm sure you'd agree. Try looking. You'll be shocked. When you've got pictures of space and you've got artist impressions of what it would look like to have Cassini at Saturn or artist impressions of what the Galileo spacecraft look like because the cameras that show the satellite or the cameras are on the satellite. It's really hard to take pictures of yourself from afar when you're there, right? So, so to, to wonder why a satellite can't take pictures of itself when its camera's on board, that shouldn't be too complicated for you. That said, the other thing is, is that satellites are incredibly far apart. They are hundreds if not thousands of kilometers apart, and they've all got jobs to do. They are taking pictures of the Earth, or they're taking pictures of space, or they're taking pictures of, of um, you know, they're doing magnetic measurements of the Earth's magnetosphere, or they're looking at ice levels, or things like that. They've got jobs to do. Now that said, there have been times when spacecraft have taken pictures of other spacecraft. Classic example is when NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was able to take pictures of the Mars rovers down on the surface of Mars or when NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter took pictures of all the Apollo landing sites. And you could actually see the footsteps of the astronauts when they walked across the surface of the moon. Now I know you don't believe in that either, but for me, and for the people who do believe it, they would think it's awesome and amazing, and in a, just a tremendous accomplishment of our space technology. Legend 27. I want to see the Milky Way before I die. The Milky Way is something that everybody can see. And for a lot of us who are in places that have fairly dark skies, the Milky Way is pretty easy to see. But for people who live, say, on the east coast of the United States, or in Europe, or Japan, right, there are these places that the light pollution is just terrible. But it's not that hard to find a place, even if you're in really light polluted, like if you're in New York City or in Toronto, there are places that you can get to that are just a few hours out of the city. There's a great place, it's called the Dark Sky Finder, and it's a map that shows, I think it's mostly Canada and the US, but it shows a light pollution map mapped over top of it so that you can actually find places where you can go and find actual proper dark skies. So, so don't wait till you die. <laughs> like, organize with your friends, talk to, you know, if, you, if you're not old enough to drive, talk to your parents, tell them that you want to see the Milky Way, use the dark sky finder, find the place, go out there, Maybe during the, uh, a meteor shower in the summertime, it's a, it's a great time, and you should definitely go see the Milky Way. Mad Obadiah. Hey Fraser, I was wondering if you could do a video about what a Type 4 civilization on the Kardashev scale would look like. Thanks. The Kardashev scale, this is this idea that a Type 1 civilization would use all the energy of its entire planet, a Type 2 civilization would use all the energy coming out of its star, and a Type 3 civilization would use all of the energy that's coming out of all the stars in its entire galaxy, it would utilize all the energy of its galaxy. We did a whole video about what, you know, how long until we're a Type 3 civilization. So what would be a Type 4 civilization? Now Kardashev didn't define a Type 4 civilization, so, so I'm just imagining what's the next level. And I guess the next level is to essentially be able to use all of the energy from all of the galaxies within the radius that is possible. In other words, you know, here we are in the Milky Way, it's possible for us to get to Andromeda if we could travel close to the speed of light. Now it's handy that Andromeda is coming our way, but there's other galaxies that we could get to if we could go the speed of light. Ones that are 10 million light years away, ones that are 100 million light years away, maybe ones that are a billion light years away. So there's a gigantic volume of space, of galaxies that we could reach if we had robot bodies and we lived forever and we had super amazing technology and not be going faster than the speed of light, still just going the speed of light. And so I, so I imagine a Type 4 civilization as a civilization that has colonized, is utilizing the energy from the entire accessible universe. Millions, maybe billions of galaxies, and each one wrap all the stars organized the way they want and wrapped in 
Dyson swarms. It's a, it's a level of, of engineering that you, you just can't even wrap your head around it. And yet, it's not impossible by the laws of physics. So that's what it would be. Nothing. But where was the point at which the Big Bang occurred? Can we not at least tell the direction of it? Once again, and we've done a bunch of episodes, but the Big Bang is not an explosion that happened in a location and went kaboom, right? So there's two possibilities for what the universe, universe is. The first thing is that the universe is infinite. In other words, if the universe is infinite and it started, and we did a whole episode on this, more dense, and we don't know how dense, infinitely dense, and then expanded, but it was still infinite. And every part of the universe is just expanding. So if it's infinite, and you go in infinity in all directions, there is no place where the Big Bang happened. It happened everywhere, every part. And we see other galaxies moving away from us, and if we're on those other galaxies, they see us moving away from them. There is no place. If the universe is finite, essentially if the universe wraps in on itself, then it's the same issue, which is that the universe is not some little point that's, that's expanding, right? It is space itself, and that if you go in any one direction, go this way, you'll come out this way. Go this way, you'll come from the bottom. It's like a three-dimensional asteroids. And that, it, once again, there's no one place where it happened. Everything is expanding. And the analogy that we always like to use in astronomy cast is that it's like raisin bread. That's, that's raisin bread that's expanding in the oven and the raisins are getting farther away from each other. But there's no one place where the raisin bread is exploding from. It's just expanding. Jared Patterson. Speaking of gas giants, why are they so radioactive? I read somewhere that one of Jupiter's moons spews material into Jupiter's magnetic field. Shouldn't those moons run out of stuff to spew and turn into rocks after a while? Shouldn't the particles be flung far away? The reason the gas giants, especially Jupiter, are so dangerous is that they have this gigantic magnetosphere. The way the Earth has a magnetosphere, and our magnetosphere is, is created by the core of the Earth is this rotating ball of iron. With Jupiter, it's, at the, it's under such pressure and temperature that at the core of it, the core is hydrogen that's been pretty much turned into, acts like a metal, it's called metallic hydrogen. And that's what's turning, and that's creating a dynamo that creates this big magnetosphere that surrounds Jupiter. And this magnetosphere is so powerful that it captures particles that are coming from the Sun into it and concentrates them. And so you've got all of these particles that are coming from the Sun, they're getting caught by Jupiter, and then they're swirling around Jupiter and just getting more and more dangerous and more concentrated. And so any spacecraft or person that tries to go through this just gets blasted with, with radiation. At the same time, there are particles that are coming off of, say, Io and the other moons, but really the issue is, is, the, is the charged particles that are coming from the Sun that Jupiter is catching. Alan the Salamander. Who's to say that aliens evolved the same survival of the fittest way? Meaning that we have no competition on their own planet, what would be the use for their advanced weapons? Maybe it's me being optimistic, but I surely hope that violence is exclusive to humans only. This is one of the thoughts when, you, when you're thinking about alien civilizations, which is you hold these two thoughts in your mind, right? One is, is that any civilization that has gotten powerful enough and capable enough to be able to cross the gulf between stars can get along with itself in some way. They're not so warlike that they've completely destroyed their civilization. They've, they've been able to figure something out. And at the same time, any civilization that can make that journey is well aware of the kinds of threats that it might face and maybe looking to extinguish them. I mean, maybe they're going to want to become friends with other aliens, but maybe they're going to want to come and, and sort of stop problems before they happen. So until we make any kind of contact with another alien civilization, we really just don't know. We just don't know what they're going to be like. We don't know what they want. We don't know if they're going to be more warlike, less warlike. And, and as we know, don't, don't listen to science fiction to tell us what that might will be. The universe can be weirder than we can even imagine. EPI endless. Can you even have a matter or antimatter black hole? Does the distinction between matter and antimatter even exist at the level of compaction? You can't. Black holes are made of black hole. 
anything that goes into the black hole, be it matter, be it antimatter, be it energy, it all just gets compacted down into black hole. There's no, there's no memory necessarily of what that stuff was. And so it doesn't still maintain the property of, of matter when it goes in. And that's why you can't have matter and antimatter really explode in, the, in a black hole. They are just black hole. And same with light. And so you could take a black hole's worth of matter and have a black hole. You could take a black hole's worth of antimatter and have a black hole. And you could take a black hole's worth of energy using E equals mc squared to make the same amount. They're all just the same. They're all just black hole. And so really this idea of a matter black hole and antimatter black hole actually don't make any sense because it's just black hole. Christopher Grillo, how big and how fast would an asteroid need to wipe out Earth? When you say wipe out Earth, what do you mean? Are you talking about wiping out all life on Earth or are you talking about destroying Earth as a planet? You know, shortly after the formation of the solar system and Earth, a large planet, probably the size of Mars, crashed into the Earth and re made it reform itself and it splashed out the moon as the remnant of that explosion. But it didn't actually destroy the Earth. So if you had two Earths come together, it would just splash in and make a new super Earth. If you're looking to like wipe out all life on Earth, that size of an impact would absolutely wipe out all life on Earth. But to wipe out most life on Earth, then you need something smaller, like maybe something that's only 10 kilometers across or a couple of kilometers across to actually just destroy all of the big mammals and anything living out on the land and anything living in the oceans and only the, the stuff that was living underground or stuff that was living deep and hydrothermal vents would, would survive. So that's what I would say. Probably in the, you know, the 10 kilometer size asteroid is the, is the life killer. Slade Greenaway. Thanks, Fraser. I think you did a great job in such a short space of time. Does this discovery change the Drake equation at all, do you think? That was in relation to the TRAPPIST-1 planets video that we just did. The Drake equation, of course, is this idea that, that there is a mathematical formula that you can use to try and figure out how many intelligent civilizations there are in the Milky Way. The problem with the Drake equation is a lot of the key parts of it don't, we don't have any knowledge. We don't know how long intelligent civilizations last. We don't know uh, what are the chances that life evolves on any one planet. Too many of the parts of the Drake equation are still unknowns. And this discovery doesn't really help us solve any of them. Until we can actually get better telescopes that show us the, the atmospheres of these worlds, to get a sense if there's life there or not, until we start to really study how life is doing on all these different planets, which of course is a very complicated thing to do, uh, we're just not going to be able to not be able to know. All right. Well, hey, thank you everybody for asking all your questions. If you've got a question, go ahead wherever you're watching this on the YouTube channel. Just type in your question, even if it's not even related to the video. I'll find it, scoop it up, and I'll answer it in this format. All right. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next week.